you know, it's a really good question. And I really do love talking to you. Like, you know, as a, since you're a musician, like, you know, it, I can see that, you know, that you're your curiosity about art is filtered through your experience as a musician and and I'm and like you know I'm also a musician but I'm also a visual artist so um what I, what I and I've and this question's been asked to me before you know how does how how is being a musician or how does your music affect your writing of this novel and I have to say like really almost not at all but the visual art completely affects the way I write. I mean, it's, I, and I feel it all. The, and also like I had sort of stopped making visual art for a long time and I kind of got back to it during the pandemic because like the art store was the only store that was open down here for a while. So I w- it would be like an outing for me just to leave my house and go. And, and also there was nothing going on socially. So I just started painting and drawing and making collages again. And that for me is more, um, is more helpful um just in terms of just like i said just being able to like you know a painter will make a painting and an oil painter or an acrylic painter and cover will paint something and then the next day paint over completely and you'll never see what was underneath that and or they'll just take a bit of like linseed oil or turpentine and just smear it across the painting just like literally erase everything that they just spent six days on i mean not ideally but it can happen I feel the same about writing. Like, you know, you get so precious about those words you write down. But if you just think of the words as paint strokes, throw them away. What's the big deal? Or make some, like, you also have to take risks as a, as a visual artist where, you know, you're just, you're holding this paintbrush. You're like, if I do this, it might ruin the painting and there's no going back. The luxury of being a writer is that you may ruin it, but you can just go back to your other draft. But why not take why not take the chance? Like, why be in this little box of like, this is how I'm going to tell my story? Hey everyone, welcome back to Living the Next Chapter. I have a guest who is so kind. Um, my guest has sent a copy of her book, The Daughtership. I'm holding it. Boo was also on a podcast called The Add to My Playlist Podcast, because in talking to Boo, I found out that she is also an artist and she's got music on Spotify. So go over to episode 61 of the Add to My Playlist podcast, hear about some great music, great conversation around music. I love it. Great episode. Now Boo's back to talk about the daughtership. Here it is. I have it in my hand again. Uh, Boo, welcome back to the podcast. Nice to have you on Living the Next Chapter. Thank you. It's so great to be here. I feel like I've seen you before. This is great. Uh, Boo, tell us uh, where you are in this big world of ours. Oh, in this big world of ours, I live in New Jersey. I live in the suburbs of New York City, in what we call a bedroom community. Nice. Excellent. And uh, your author journey, let's jump in right away. Where did it start for you to to go down the author journey and maybe a little history behind the book I'm holding in my hands? I have been on the author journey for many, many a moon. I am 56 and I started writing fiction when I was 20, I guess. I started with poetry in high school because that's where one starts. And then I started writing stories in college. And so I actually tried to get my first novel published when I was 23. Um, So it's been a long road. I have not yet. This is my first published novel, but it's not the first novel that I've written and spent many, many nights and days on. So. A lot of hard work. <laughs> it's amazing. So and when, craziness when you... and absolute craziness to keep going. When did you start writing this book? Uh, the Daughtership? Uh, yeah. Well, technically, you could say I started writing this novel in the 90s because there's a section of the book that was actually a rewrite of the first or second novel that I wrote. And so um, sometimes people will say, oh, you know, the, the, the writing about the 90s seems so real. I'm like, yeah, well, I actually wrote it in the 90s, so that's why. Uh, so, yeah, there's like a there's one chunk of the book where the character is living in New York and sort of hitting bottom in her alcoholism that uh, was written in the 90s. And then I kind of just carried it forward and rewrote it, and it, it's, it was the seed that was the beginning of the daughtership. So I've been writing this book for a lot of years. It's amazing. Okay, so give us a big overview what are we going to find when we open the cover of da- of the daughtership? Overview. Well, it is a very different kind of storytelling. Um, it's written from many points of view, and it is 
about a woman who is in her the middle stage of her life who has to reckon with ghosts from her childhood. And the structure of the book tracks her in her current life. She's in her 40s. She has two teenagers living in the suburbs. And then also returns back to her 20s when she first tried to battle these demons and did a pretty good job. So she battled them once and got her life under control to some degree. But this book is more about the deep deep, deep stuff that that will come back and will haunt you and also will unfortunately get passed down to your kids if you don't face it. And so this novel is really about her facing some truths that she doesn't want to face. And But it's told in this very original way. <laughs> so. so going along with the submarine on the, on the cover. So this yeah. is a deep dive. A deep dive, yes. That's a right? yes. very apt metaphor. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about some of the main characters we're going to come across in the book as well. Well, like I said, there's three, there's different levels. So on the top level, like, and we can talk about it a bit as the surface and then the middle and then the sub deep subconscious, um, on the surface, it's Catherine and she's a wife and a mother and a sort of a disappointed artist. And she's just struggling in her marriage. Um, she's been married for a long time and marriage is not giving her what she needs and it's just coming out sideways and causing a lot of stress then she then there's this younger version of her whose name is catchy so it's the same character but she has a nickname catchy and that is that really tracks the childhood and the ad adolescence and the young adulthood of the same character Catherine. so it kind of goes back in time it's like a flashback um to the formative years and the formative experiences that are feeding into her inner dilemmas. So they're all relevant to the way that she's living now um, and the problems that she has now. And then the other level, the deepest level is this rusted submarine that this is very fantastical, surrealistic fiction, this part of the book. Uh, it's a rusted submarine and it's um, trapped on the bottom of a lake in Virginia Beach, which is where she grew up. And on that submarine are her inner children. So these parts of her, these lost, abandoned parts of her that really are begging for her attention. And also they don't get along with each other at all. So it's almost as if she has this inner family um, that is at war with each other and struggling and also suffocating because they're on the submarine that has no air and it something has to be done. So then on top of it all, there's a, there's a level above all that. You can look at it sort of as like a, <laughs> a club sandwich. Um, <laughs> but at the top layer of the sandwich, like above it all, hovering over it, is her ancestors. So there's this character named Dead Girl who represents all of her grandmothers and all of the women in the matriarchy and the sort of matrilineal line that came before her. So, yeah, there's a lot going on. Wow. So, okay, <laughs> there's so many levels. How do you, as an author, approach writing this? Was there anything that you learned about yourself as you wrote this book? Oh, my goodness. Was there anything I didn't learn about myself mm. when I wrote this book? This book is um, basically me learning about myself, I would say. I mean, okay. that's, that's you know, like I said, I've been writing fiction for a long time. And this novel, I call it a process novel, this novel, I just completely um, went kind of rogue on my former writing practices. And I used all these different experiments and techniques to really access the subconscious. And also, I started blending some of the therapeutic practices that I was using in my life um, with my writing practices. And I turned it into this very playful, experimental writing um, adventure really. So I did learn a lot about myself. I mean, I think, you know, the novel is heavily autobiographical. Um, and so there's this, I mean, it is obviously fiction since a lot of the novel takes place on a rusty submarine at the bottom of a lake, but, I, but the core emotional truths are very resonant with my own experience. So let me okay, see, so did I quite answer I like you? It. Yeah, no, it's good. Um, like, so I'm a musician and when mm -hmm. I write music, even if it's recorded, edited, done, complete, finished, 
it never really totally fe- feels finished to me. Mm-hmm. Like I feel, and that's why I created my podcast, Living the Next Chapter, because I feel like I'm always kind of tinkering with my music, even after it's quote done mm-hmm. and out in the world. I'm always playing with it. So I'm always living my music every day. Um, and then that's, again, why I have this show. Is Do you ever feel like, even though it's done, like it's in my hands and I'm holding a copy of it, is this really done or is it still kind of being developed in your mind? Or can you give me some insight on that? It's done. It's done? Oh, good. It's okay, very good. done. I'd it's then explain that really to you because wonderful. I don't understand that from the music <laughs> side. Yeah. <laughs> It's really wonderful to see you holding that book in your hands. Um, <laughs> oh my God, yes. Well, I'm also, as you know, I'm also a musician, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast. And I used to really torture myself listening to my music and thinking how I could mix it differently or go back in. And, you know, and I did go back in and remix one of my um, CDs because I just couldn't live with the reverb on one of the vocals, you know. So, so I understand. Oops, I understand what you're saying. Um, but with this book, uh, I mean, you had asked earlier how long it took to write it. I mean, and I mentioned that I had been working on a piece of it in the 90s, but it took about eight years um, from start to finish. Um, and this book feels very, very done. And in fact, it's really freeing. Um, it's a really, you know, so in, the, so in the beginning of the book, the character is fairly dissociated. I don't know if you know what that means, but she's she's just not really present in her own life and her psyche is broken up into all these fragmented versions of one person. It's really a novel about identity. Um, And so she really can't hold a position um, in her own life because she's so dissociated. And in the process of the novel, it's really a novel of integration. Like, can she, can she integrate enough to all these little parts that was talking about, like the little children and then her past selves and also this DNA, this ancestral shame that she's reckoning with that I said was represented by the character Dead Girl. If she can, can she integrate it all? So not just so that she can hold one position, but even want to. And I hope that makes sense. But I think, it, you know, it just to even want to be present in her own life, um, you have to want it before you can have it. And so I would say that in the process for me, if that's what this book's about, I went through that same process, not exactly in the same eight years, but some of the writing techniques and the therapeutic practices that I talk about that, that fed into the writing of the book have contributed to my own integration. And um, there's a word I like to use sovereignty, which is just like owning my own place here on the planet. So yeah, it was very healing for me. I think that I hope that the book will healing will be healing for people to read it in the same way. Amazing. So when you're writing this, are you writing it for an audience or you're writing it for yourself? I'm a pretty performative person. <laughs> um, I've always been that way. I'm always writing for an audience. Like, you know, even when I'm alone in my house, there's like an invisible audience just watching me yeah. and go about my business. So um, there's always an audience in mind. I don't let that hold me back. And I don't write for an audience in the sense that I'm worried about what they'll think, or I'm trying to do something for them. And especially not in this sort of like here, this book's going to heal you. Um, I didn't write it that way, but now that it's finished, you know, I had, and also based on some of the feedback I've been getting, I do think it is kind of a different kind of a reading experience. Any of that feedback that's kind of caught you off guard, or maybe you didn't anticipate? Because I know in music, for example, we write a song, and we write it we write it about A and somebody walks up to us and says, I love the song where you talk about B. And you're like, I didn't write about B, I wrote about A. But you <laughs> heard that in your heart, in your mind, and you experienced something that I wasn't anticipating. So thank you. But did you kind of see a little bit of that in some of the feedback you heard back so far? Well, the book is really about truth um, and denial. And so I'd say that the part of the part of the readership or the response that's been hard for me is what people haven't asked me about. Um, Cause there's, you know, at the, at the, there's at the dark heart of the book, I don't want to give too much away, but there's an experience that this character has that she just cannot make peace with. And she's made peace with it up to a point, but she can't a hundred percent like face it. And so it's just funny because I've gotten emails sometimes before I start an interview where people who have read the book will say, 
is there anything you don't want me to talk about? And I know what they're really saying is there's some stuff that I don't want to talk about. And that's okay because it's pretty dark. It's pretty intense, but it's also pretty common and important and very, very important to me that we do talk about it. So um, that part has been weird. And even in my own family, like some of my family members, you know, there's this, this ability to sort of read something and be like, that's great, but not really talk about what it's about. So in fact, it's kind of the opposite. It's not that people have had interpretations. I've really haven't had, haven't had any feedback that felt like they were like, I wrote A and they read B. It's more that I wrote A and they don't want to, they don't want to talk about it. Okay. Well, that's, no, that's, that was in your plans from the beginning as you wrote the the novel, though. You, you had some certain things you wanted to achieve, some goals, right, in mind. So you kind of have to plan those in. Was that difficult to kind of know editing wise for yourself what you wanted to include and what was not going to be part of this? I keep, I'm laughing because I feel like I'm 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 like contradicting you when you're asking me questions. I'm not doing. It I like purpose. it though. That's what yeah. we're doing. That's <laughs> um, I didn't do anything on, intentionally there. Yeah. No, I didn't set out writing this book like, oh, I'm gonna air all of this um, grievance or air all of this intensity. I just. Um, like I said, you know, I, I was very um, open to the process of this book. And, um, you know, it, it at the end, it really, I certainly never thought it was going to include children trapped on a on an airless submarine. Um, and I just used a lot of tools and a lot of um, basically games, writing games when I was doing it. And so, and, and again, I combined my work in my recovery life and in my therapy life with my work as an artist and a writer. And I did visual art and I did meditation. I did movement. I did, I mean, almost, you know, just uh, anything that was suggested in any, I did a lot. I took a lot of workshops. I worked with other writers and, you know, I just really let go. And in the process of letting go, you know, I really gained this novel out of it, but I don't, I didn't set out with anything in mind actually. Okay. So, Talk about writing games. I've never had anybody in 300 plus episodes talk about writing games. What, can you give us an idea? What, what does this involve? Um, well, well, first of all, I'm a big believer in never, um, never thinking you know everything, and never, never to never stop taking classes and workshops and working with coaches and that kind of thing. So, and and part of that too comes from being a visual artist, you know, because I'm always. I mean, I I'm always I can always draw better. I can always paint better. And also, I you know I take art. I take visual art classes so that I can be in a room with a model, or you know, even just learn from other people's techniques. There's always techniques that I can learn. Um, and I, I and that has fed into my writing as well. So I took even though I was writing a novel, I took memoir writing workshops and I took poetry workshops and the poets are big on games. A lot of poetry gets generated from, you know, quote unquote games or tricks, for example, like looking at a photograph and then you would look at a photograph and then you would cover it up, turn it upside down and then try to remember everything you saw in the photograph, after, you know, without looking at it, you know, and so you would try to write to describe the photograph. Generally, you'd be a little bit off or a little bit wrong. And somehow in that gap or in that mistake, you would come up with something interesting, some interesting writing or another game is uh, it's a surrealist game that, that dates back to like the 1920s where you uh, it's called cut ups where you take a page of your writing that you've written and you highlight the stuff that's good. You cut it up and then you mix it in with highlighted passages from another page that may or may not have anything to do with the page that you cut up. You cut up those two pages, you flip it all around, and you make a collage out of it, and then you write something new based on that. So again, just um, that's really – they really felt that that was a great way to access the subconscious. And this was in like, you know, the the heyday of new the, – the new understanding that there's so much in our psyche uh, that we haven't previously accessed. And so that was the idea behind that. And – it works for me, and it was just, and it's also fun, really fun, really fun to write that way. Nice. See, now you're making my mind go. I like this <laughs> because there's so many different ways of approaching writing, and yeah. again, we have authors listening, and maybe that's an exercise they're not haven't tried yet or haven't even heard of. So that opens the door for them to go. Wait a minute, I, I need I need to get out there and get some more experience and get in front of other people who write in different ways than I would approach and learn some of their best practices and bring them back to my to my story and what I'm working on. I always think that that's a really good idea. 
I really do. And I, and, and also just, you know, in terms of writing, it's like we learned to write in, in elementary school. And we have this idea of like beginning, middle, end, you know, that doesn't have to be the case. You can write 16 beginnings and then paste them together. And that might be a really interesting story. Um, but you know, we just, we are very, we are taught how to write and we are taught how to write one way. And it's not always the best way. Like, like I said, you know, for me, I like the main character in my novel. Like I said, there's a lot of autobiographical parallels. I'm fairly dissociated or I used to be. And I, and I found that writing from six different points of view is the natural way for me to write. I I sit down to write. I can be writing from one point of view today, but tomorrow I'll have a completely different point of view and or five minutes later. So it was hard for me to expect myself to take the same tone and the same voice and the same position as a storyteller on for every chapter. So I just stopped trying. And, and that came out of working with um, in a workshop with a teacher, you know, so I really do think it's good to just almost forget about everything that you know and forget about thinking you're a good writer and forget about thinking that you know more than other people and go in with a beginner's mind and just let go and go a little crazy and see what happens. You can always throw those pages away, but I didn't. They ended up being my book. What's interesting too about your story is you have another lever that a lot of authors don't have that you can use if you need to, and that's your musical background. At any point during the writing process, did you actually pull on that lever at all, or was that completely separate from your writing of the novel? You know, it's a really good question, and I really do love talking to you. Like, you know, as a, since you're a musician, like, you know, it, I can see that, you know, that your, your curiosity about art is filtered through your experience as a musician, and, and I'm and like, you know, I'm also a musician, but I'm also a visual artist, so... um what I, what I, and I've, and this question has been asked to me before, you know, how does, how, how is being a musician or how does your music affect your writing of this novel? And I have to say like really almost not at all, hmm. but the visual art completely affects the way I write. I mean, it's, I, and I feel it all. The, and also like I had sort of stopped making visual art for a long time and I kind of got back to it during the pandemic because like the art store was the only store that was open down here for a while. So I w- it would be like an outing for me just to leave my house and go. And and also there was nothing going on socially. So I just started painting and drawing and making collages again. And that for me is more, um, is more helpful um, just in terms of just, like I said, just being able to like, you know, a painter will make a painting and an oil painter or an acrylic painter and cover will paint something and then the next day paint over completely and you'll never see what was underneath that and or they'll just take a bit of like linseed oil or turpentine and just smear it across the painting just like literally erase everything that they just spent six days on i mean not ideally but it can happen i feel the same about writing like you know you get so precious about those words you write down but if you just think of the words as paint strokes throw them away what's the big deal or make some like you also have to take risks as a as a visual artist where you know you're just you're holding this paintbrush and like if I do this it might ruin the painting and there's no going back the luxury of being a writer is that you may ruin it but you can just go back to your other draft but why not take why not take the chance like why be in this little box of like this is how I'm going to tell my story is that taking of your liberty and wherever you're going to go with it the one thing I love about music is that it's a part of your brain that a lot of people don't access mm-hmm. for whatever reason because they're not in that space. Mm-hmm. So I feel like there's even beyond the mechanics of writing in mm-hmm. the technique, there's a certain part of your brain activated by the creative process that I think mm-hmm. could really benefit an author if they could somehow tap into that part of their thinking and part of how they process things. Like for me, like my wife is has no musical background at all. And I hear things and see things differently than she does because yeah. I'm tapping into a piece of my brain that she hasn't really experienced yet. So she sees the world one way, I see it differently because I think in that musical right. kind of creative space, right? So if we can tap into that as an author, I think that can definitely benefit and find well, new avenues. Well, I mean, almost avenues, every writer right? I know listens to music when they write. I mean, I, I, I always, I'm always queuing up my... That's always the same stuff, but <laughs> it's, it's like usually it's not music with lyrics. It's usually it's a weird instrumental, like you know, very like like um, ambient stuff. But 
Yeah. I mean, so in that sense, you can, you know, and I don't know. And also every, I'm sure every writer is different. Every musician is different. So there's probably musicians who feel that their musical um, vocabulary or their musical sensibility really does pour into their their fiction writing. But for me, I, I don't feel the connection. And if it's there, I haven't, I don't know what it is, but that's just me. So I can't speak for everybody. I think everything that we have in our life, they're all parts, there are elements to our toolkit that makes us unique. Mm-hmm. And different from every other author or musician or painter, everything, because we're pulling from different resources that we don't have all shared in common. So how I approach what I do is completely different than how you do it. And I think that's one of the things that a lot of authors struggle with is they're like, well, is there world? Is there room in the world for another novel? You know, like, can I find my place in this world when there's so many other great novels out there? But the uniqueness of who you are can't be duplicated by anyone else in this entire world because you've only lived what you've lived and no one else has. So you see well, yeah. things, you've heard things, right? So your your uniqueness is not in maybe the content or the topic, but your view of the world. And I don't think anyone else could have written this book, to be quite honest. Oh, definitely not. Absolutely right. not. But I, I would also say that like I'm a little different because I actually do feel um, that the daughtership is a unique novel in the sense that it is new. Like it is a new kind of a novel. Like it's, I'm calling it a process novel, but you know, the feedback that I have gotten is that no, like even before I sold the book to an editor, it was like, we, I've never read a book like this before. And I I was going to mention that earlier because I feel like I, part of it is because I did just get so free and wild um, with my writing practice, but also when you do that, you give your reader like the benefit of the doubt, you know, that a reader can step up. A reader knows how to read a novel. Like you just said, there's a million novels out there. And we've all been reading, quote unquote, stories and novels since kindergarten. But because we know how to read, we could read anything, you know. So and I think also with um TV and film and, you know, Netflix and binge watching and all that, we have this ability to jump from scene to scene, character to character, storyline to storyline that isn't always taken advantage of in fiction. And I do take advantage of that in this book. Like it jumps around a lot, but I also feel like, you know, it's challenging. I think that anyone who reads my novel, like I read, I'm not supposed to read my reviews, but I read one of the, a Goodreads review that said, just just let it go and let the book be what it is and you'll enjoy it. And I, and I think that was great advice because it isn't like any other book, even though, like you said, there's, I mean, maybe it's like some other book, but not, not many, like you said, though, there's a million books out there, but this one's different. I mean, it's not going to be for everybody, but it's definitely telling a story in a new way. I think. Any, any thoughts around making assumptions of who your audience is while you're writing your book? Does that, does that limit authors and, from your perspective, having this idea of, well, I'm writing this book for this audience in particular. I hope to connect with them. Do you find that limiting? Because in podcasting, we create podcasts for an audience that we feel would be our ideal listener. So we kind of tailor right. our content to that person in our mind. Do you find that making assumptions, does that hinder you or does that not bother you as an author? I'm resistant to that, but I have been, I took a marketing class, um, sort of a, I was in a marketing group when the book came out. It was like a social media marketing coaching mastermind group. And in order to get started, I had to fill out this questionnaire and the questionnaire had that kind of language in it. Like, who's your ideal reader? Who, you know, who do you think your audience is? And I was just like, don't make me, I don't want to say, I don't want to think about it. And, and like on my, I, you know, I, I, and I kind of made this super inclusive list that pretty much includes everyone who can read. And the coach was kind of like, well, no, you really want to narrow it down to, to who, who's your ideal reader. So I'm, I'm familiar with that and I'm resistant at the same time, but it's probably, um, I mean, I would say I'm, so, so there's two questions on the table. You're asking me, um, first of all, you're asking me, no, you're not asking me who my ideal reader is. You're asking me, what do I think about that when you're yeah. writing a book, right? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Like, is it, is it, is it, is it dangerous to have an assumption of who your audience is or do you just write with no restrictions at all? Just, this is my story and I want to get it out there. Well, I think probably, I think I probably write for myself, like 
I probably write for the reader that I am. And I think probably most writers do that, you know, that, you know, it's almost as if like, well, I speak English, do you speak English? So I'm going to write in English, you know, it's like, and so, you know, I remember when I'm like, I was in my twenties and that, and I, I tried to get my first novel published, which was a maniacal, absolutely unreadable sort of cacophony of madness, but I still thought it should have <laughs> been published. And so I, um, was sending it around and I, a friend of mine's mother-in-law was an agent. And so she met with me and, and she said, you need to just read more, just, just read more. Like what you need in order to be a better writer is to read more and read, 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 read. So that was easy. Cause I do love to read. Um, but in that sense, I think you, whatever you're reading and whatever you have, all the books you've read that you have behind you kind of create the kind of writer you are and also probably set up the expectation for who's going to be reading your book because, you have that sort of reading reference. Does that make sense? That yeah. answer? Do you know what yeah. I mean? It's almost as if as a reader, you create your own future, <laughs> your, your own audience. Yeah. Cause like, you know, if you read, if you read only read Charles Dickens all the time, then you would probably be writing for people who would love Charles Dickens. Right. But it's coming through your soul. It's coming through your point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then to lean back into the music side one more time, uh, you have no, please be my just, guest. I they love just it. create music for for hits. Right? Oh, you have artists and that just, create music for hits. Is that's that it. They don't. They don't care really about anything else except I want to write for that person so that I can sell more records. Instead of like you as an artist coming to your recordings, going, "No, this is the song I want to sing. I don't care really if anybody cares about this song more than I do. But this, I have to share this message. And if I get a listen, great. But for me in podcasting, I create the podcast I would listen to. Right. And uh, that is my audience, me. Right. I get to be right. completely selfish in the moment and say, I really, to be quite honest, if no one listens to my solo episode of me on the mic, I really don't care because I really wanted to share this part of me with the world and get to let you see me and my opinions, my thoughts, my journey. And I'm here to share my message. So if you fall in love with that, you're going to like me if you like my content, because I made it for me. So as an author, if I write a book that means something to me, then if you love it, you're really going to like me as an author. And I'm, I find that to be a very accommodating space where I don't have to be on stage for an audience. I'm just writing for an audience of one, me. Mm -hmm. And then if you love it, you're going to love what I do. And then we're going to do community because there's a connection. Right. So that's kind of how I approach my music and my podcasts. I haven't written a book yet, but um, that's kind of well, how it I Well, it sounds like we're the same, right? I mean, yeah. that's sort of what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I agree with you on that. And But at the same time, I'd love to have a hit. I'd love for the book to be a bestseller. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I, and yeah, I would sure. love for my, you know, so it's not, I'm not averse to being um, a hit maker. <laughs> but you <laughs> didn't go into the studio to make a hit. You I was never good at writing that. The book. <laughs> you, know, you went into writing the book for a reason. I'm and not it wasn't good at that. to get a hit. Yeah. <laughs> right. So if you get the success that you yeah. hope for yeah. as a result, it wasn't because of your planning for a target audience. It was, I have a story to tell and the audience found me and now it's a hit. That's a true hit to me than just creating something you've done in the past and then just making another copy of this book, hoping it's going to be another success. You know, right. that's there's a difference there in, in the process, I think. Well, that's the key word process. And, that, and that's what I was saying earlier. I'm, I'm very, um, like in my writing group, I'm in a group with some other writers. We meet once a week and we meet on Zoom and we, it's really an accountability group where we just sort of say, what are you writing? How was your week? What do you, we don't, you know, we don't often, it's not like we're talking about each other's work that much, but um, I'm, all, they're always focused on my process. You know, I'm always the one who's, or as you say, process, like they're just, yeah. they're just like, oh, Boo's the one who's into the process. What's your process this week? You know, and, and sometimes like, you know, um, one time I made a PowerPoint presentation about all the things I was doing to kind of move my novel along. This is a new novel that I'm working on. It's, and it was, it was sort of like a um, performance of sorts. So yeah, I'm about process. Um, I actually like that pronunciation. And when you're about well, there's process, an o in there. there's and no, you don't there's need no to a. worry so much. You don't need to worry there's, so much about your audience until you're done. Yeah, yeah. Right. there is an O in there. We say ah, process. So see, it's just like, see. So process. we have to have a, we'll have, to have a conversation yeah. offline about that. But, <laughs> and you guys say niche, we say niche. You know, so uh oh, we say both. Stuff. I never know. That's one of those words that I'm terrified to use because I don't really think I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> I love it. Um, okay, so Boo, uh, again, uh, this would be a great gift item. We have a gift giving season coming up. 
people are looking for great ideas. Who, if I'm going to an online site or I'm going into a store to buy this, who is this a great gift for or a great read for personally? Can you explain to us so that we know who we, in our mind, were like, oh, Aunt Ruth is going to love this. So kind of give us an idea of who this would be for. You would want to give this novel to your deep friend, your friend that's not afraid to talk about uh, real stuff, um, your friend who can be found in the self-help section at the bookstore, but just as easily in the literary fiction section that is a big reader that's smart. You know, it's a pretty challenging read. Um, just, uh, and you know, it's not a genre book. It's a, it's a literary fiction book. So your smart friend, you know, your English major friend, or, um, I mean, and, you know, I've had, I, it doesn't, it's not really gendered. I've had equal positive feedback from men and women. So it's not, you can give it to your Aunt Ruth or your Uncle Jerry, um, as long as they're up for a deep dive. It's funny, too. It's a funny book. I mean, I know it doesn't sound like it would be funny, but weirdly, it's pretty funny. And hence the submarine, a deep dive. Yes, yeah. I get all that. Uh, <laughs> um, so before we go, uh, Boo, uh, the one, I have a question for you at the end before we finish off. But as far as where the book is available and... Uh, how they can get it, and as well, how they can be in touch with you uh, to carry on the conversation. I do have other podcasters who listen to the show. They're looking for great guests. I would love to have you on their shows as well. But um, as far as being in touch with you, how do they do that? Well, I have my website, um, bootronville.com, and I'm on Instagram and I'm on TikTok. I'm doing my little thing on TikTok now. And, you know, the book is put out by Pantheon, which is part of Penguin Random House. Um, so... It's you can ha you can get it anywhere. It was I, I know it was at Barnes and Noble in the summer when it came out, but there's like this constant uh, flow of like you said, like I don't know how many million books get published per year. So I'm not sure it would still be on the shelf, but you could get it online if it were not. And uh, I also always encourage people to buy it from their neighborhood bookstore because yes. I love bookstores. Yeah. So I'm, a, book, I. I I'm a bookworm, so. and I love bookstores and it's libraries. The, I love the smell libraries. of a bookstore, the ambiance of a bookstore. Yeah, there's something mm -hmm. special about that. It's a happy place. Um, so last question for you, Boo, before we go. What has been, to date, the proudest moment for you as an author in the process or the result of the book? There's been so many blessings that have come out of writing this book and having it published, I feel so grateful. And also I, I would have to say that like, for me, the proudest moment, and this is, you know, you told me that um, there's authors listening to this show. Um, for me, the proudest moment is that I never gave up that I, uh, you know, I've had a lot of rejections and the rejection doesn't really stop. I and mean, I still, even once you have a book out, you can still be rejected. Um, but I just never gave up. I never stopped making art. I've never stopped, you know, I've made a lot of sacrifices for it, honestly, um, and had to deal with some, I don't know what the word is, just people that didn't believe in me or believe in my path and wondered what the heck I've been doing all my life. And I just keep going and I, I know I'm an artist and I'm going to keep making my art. And in this sense, it's the book, but you know, it's, it's writing the novel. And I literally had someone once say to me, you'll never get it published. And, you know, I just, you know, would love to, you know, well, that wasn't true. So that's what I'm proud of that. I, that even with people saying things like that to me, I never gave up. Well, somebody said a long time ago, if, uh, it's not bragging if you've done it and, You've done it. And um, it's great to have a copy in my hands. And like I mentioned to you, I'm going to take it down. Was I no, bragging? No, no. I think Maybe we a little need bit. to. <laughs> we need to because we need to celebrate the path, the journey of creating this. I am taking this down to Niagara Falls and taking some pictures of it for you. Uh, and uh, it's a great thing to be able to hold a book in my hand from an author on the show. Um, thank you for, for sending this up to me. I really appreciate it.
Well, you promised me you were you were going to throw it over the, the Niagara Falls, right? No, no, it, no, it, no, 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 <laughs> that, that would be littering and I could probably go to jail. Um, and I would never do that to your book. In a uh, barrel? You're not going to throw no, it over yeah, Maybe in a barrel. Maybe. That's an idea. <laughs> maybe we'll look into that. Uh, so, Boo, thank you so much for uh, being on Living the Next Chapter and on the Add to My Playlist podcast. I've had you now twice on my shows and... You know, we're going to have to go for a three-peat and have you somewhere else as well. I hope so. It's really been, really been wonderful talking to you. So thank you. Amazing. And as you go out and promote this on other shows and become rich and famous, <laughs> as I hope you will be, that you remember us little listeners here on Living the Next Chapter. We're cheering you on in the process as well. Amazing. Everyone go check out all the information in the show notes, as well a link if you want to hear more about Boo's amazing musical career and some really amazing songs. Head over to our Add to My Playlist podcast as well. You get a little bit more Boo, and we all need that in our life. So, Boo, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for being part of the podcast again. Appreciate you investing time in the show and you for listening this far. Thank you. One thing to keep in mind is we are looking for help and some support for the podcast. If you are able to help support our show, our little podcast show here, we can go over to livingthenextchapter.com and all the instructions will be there to help support the show. It takes about 30 to $40 a month to do this just for the hosting and all of that other stuff that we pay for. But if the show is giving you any value and, you, and you're enjoying what's happening here, we'd love any kind of support that you can offer. That would be great. And you being here and sharing the show helps us grow, helps us get great new authors on the show, connect with other listeners, and build community. So whatever you can do to share this show today, I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here on for living the next chapter, and I can't wait to share the next one with you. Talk soon. Have a great day. Are you searching for your next favorite author? Then Book Banter with Diane Burkhart is the podcast for you. We have amazing guests from indie authors to traditionally published authors and every hybrid in between. If you're an author, we have something for you too. Besides being able to be a guest on our show, we also pepper our lineup occasionally with publishing industry professionals like editors, publicists, marketing coaches, and so many more are coming. So be sure to check out Book Banter with Diane Burkhart, Book Talk Podcast, with new episodes dropping every Wednesday. You can find us on the major streaming services or on our own website, burkhartbooks.com slash podcast. Be sure to subscribe today so you never miss an episode, because if you love books like we do, you do not want to miss this podcast. <laughs>